Okay. Thank you, everyone. Welcome for joining. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, PNS course on processing in memory. Thank you very much for joining. Um, our course, as I already said, is titled PNS on processing in memory for short. Uh, for long, it's uh, exp exploring the processing in memory paradigm for future computing systems. Um, in this next slide, you can see uh, the information that you can find in the course catalog about this course, uh, also a link to the course catalog. And if you uh, take a closer look at this description and the objective of this course, you'll see that we talk about data movement between the memory units and the compute units in uh, current computing systems and, uh, and how costly this data movement is. Um, as an example, 62% of the total system energy uh, for consumer applications is um, spent on data movement. This is what we call the data movement bottleneck, and it's essentially the main issue that we are going to try to solve in this course. This data movement, uh, movement bottleneck affects uh, many important workloads these days, like machine learning, computational biology, graph processing, databases, video analytics, et cetera. And you will see some examples of these workloads um, uh, over the course of uh, this semester. And essentially to solve this data movement bottleneck or to overcome this data movement bottleneck, it's necessary to do a paradigm shift in the way that we design computing systems. The key idea is going to be proce uh, placing processing elements closer to memory or even inside memory. This is what we call uh, processing in memory. If we take a look at this uh, slide, this motivational slide about the cost of uh, data movement in terms of energy, I'm using here one slide from Bill Daly presented in HyPIC 2015. You see that the uh, memory accesses consume almost three orders of magnitude more energy than a complex addition, for example. We will go back to uh, this slide later, but first of all, let me state what are the goals of this PNS course. As I said before, please feel free to stop me anytime if you have questions about the course logistics that we are going to present today about the uh, uh, Safari Research Group and our research lines. And finally, I will talk about, I will give a brief introduction to processing in memory. And in later lectures, we will continue elaborating on many of the topics of the processing in memory topics that we are going to start covering today. Um, feel free to ask questions. Also, uh, for anyone watching the lecture in YouTube, feel free to ask questions as well in the YouTube chat. I'd be glad to uh, read them and answer um, if, uh, uh, if they really make sense. So, uh, contents of this course, we will introduce you to the data movement bottleneck, which is a major threat to high performance and energy efficiency of current computing systems, as we are already uh, explaining. Uh, you will learn what are key workload characteristics that make uh, these workloads more prone to the data movement bottleneck. And we will review traditional approaches to alleviate the data movement bottleneck, uh, but also, and more importantly, uh, you will get familiar with the new research proposals and uh, real systems that represent processing in memory solutions. And um, as part of this course, you will have to do a hands-on project. Uh, these projects are the ones that we are going to offer to introduce in your next meeting. Some of these projects will be you know, different um, uh, topics and different goals like analyzing workloads, programming real PIM architectures, or simulating uh, new PIM proposals, for example. Uh, processing in memory is not something new, but it's something that uh, starts becoming a reality these days. But if you go to the literature, you will find papers uh, that are more than 50 years old, like, for example, these uh, cellular logic in memory arrays from William Coutts, or this other one that is contemporary titled A Logic in Memory Computer from uh, Harold Stone. So it's been more than 50 years since these uh, proposals until one company released, uh, designed, fabricated, and started to commercialize the first real-world processing in memory architecture. And this company is a French company called AppMem. And what they have done is fabricating uh, DRAM memory in a standard DDR4 DIMMs, uh, where 
inside each of the chips, we don't only have memory, DRAM memory arrays as usual, but also a small processors or small uh, general purpose cores that uh, are called DRAM processing units or DPUs and can be really useful and suitable to accelerate some important workloads. Here you have a, a picture of the uh, AppMem DIMMs with the different PIM enabled chips or PIM chips. And here you have uh, another picture of a, a large system with more than 2,500 DPUs or these small cores that I mentioned in, in, in mentioning inside the uh, DRAM chips. In this picture, you can identify uh, two CPUs. It's a dual socket system that uh, has conventional DRAM memory that is still being used as the main memory of the system, as you see in this um, scheme here, and also other DIMMs, the AppMem DIMMs that uh, represent this PIM enabled memory. This architecture is already capturing a lot of attention from uh, industry, from Academia, we ha um, uh, have been uh, so lucky that uh, uh, since a while have been working with this architecture, programming it, analyzing it, and you guys are also going to have uh, the opportunity to do it if you are um, interested on this. And as I said, it's capturing a, a lot of attention, including uh, ETH news. This is uh, something that has been released today. They talk uh, about our work on processing in memory and in particular uh, with the admin PIM system. It's a very uh, nice and um, um, easy reading uh, to start learning about processing in memory. But if you want to learn more and many more details about this processing in memory architecture, I can recommend you our uh, loan paper that is uh, already available in archive. Um, if you don't have time to read the whole paper, uh, you can definitely uh, read the shorter version of it that we published uh, at the end of last year, or watch uh, one of the different lectures and, um, and, um, and talks that we have given about this uh, architecture. And actually, uh, as you can imagine, this architecture is uh, going to represent some of the main contents of this course as well. So for sure, you will learn more about it in later lectures. But this admin company uh, is not the only company that is starting to fabricate and commercialize processing in memory systems. About one year ago, Samsung announced their first processing in memory system, FIM DRAM or HBM PIM, that um, is based on the fast, uh, the high bandwidth uh, HBM2 memory, and it's uh, targeted at uh, artificial intelligence applications. What essentially Samsung did is um, using HPM memory, which is a 3D stack memory, as you can see here, composed by multiple layers of DRAM, multiple uh, DRAM dice. Um, and, um, and some of these uh, DRAM dice have been modified to incorporate some processing elements inside them. You're going to see a um, more clear picture in the next, in next slide, but here you can already see what are the type of operations that these processing elements are able to execute. And as you see, multiply, multiply, accumulate, and multiply, add, which are key operations for um, artificial intelligence and machine learning workload, workloads. Um, here you see another view or, or a view of one of these uh, DRAM layers that compose the uh, HBM2 memory or the HBM PIM uh, proposal by Samsung, um, as you can see, uh, some of the uh, cells of the DRAM cells uh, in the banks have been replaced by these uh, PCU blocks that are the compute units, the execution units that um, can uh, perform um, multiplication, addition, etc., for uh, machine learn learning workloads. And it's not the only proposal from Samsung itself. Also, we learned last year about this uh, AX team that is a DIM based system. It's different from the previous one in the sense that instead of modifying the DRAM layers themselves to integrate uh, processors, as um, for example, um, AppMem or uh, the HBM pin from Samsung do. Here, what they do is placing the compute units on the same beam as the DRAM chips. 
and they have shown nice, interesting, I mean, pretty good, interesting, and, and interesting results for recommendation systems where they compare a baseline system with an AX team system where some of the uh, original um, uh, DRAM teams have been replaced with these AX team uh, with processing capabilities. And here you see um, uh, a picture of this uh, prototype that they use for their study and for their uh, analysis. And also from another major DRAM vendor, SK Hynix, a couple of weeks ago, we learned about their first uh, uh, real processing in memory system, accelerator in memory, uh, that is using, in this case, uh, GDDR6 uh, DRAM memory. And um, it's, um, uh, in principle, uh, suitable for machine learning, high performance computing, big data computation, and storage. In later lectures, we will talk more in detail about all these uh, processing in memory uh, architectures and proposals for from uh, different uh, actors in the industry. And when we finish this course, you will have learned a lot about processing in memory because these uh, about computer architecture and processing in memory because this um, PNS, this course is aimed at improving your knowledge in computer architecture and in processing in memory, also improve your technical skills in either parallel programming um, for processing in memory architectures or computer and computer architecture simulation. Um, you will improve your critical thinking and analysis, essentially because you are going to be doing research with us um, and you will have the opportunity to get familiar not uh, only with the specific topic that you work on or the specific research uh, that you do, but also you will get exposed to other uh, research directions uh, from um, our group. And finally, you will also improve your uh, technical presentation skills uh, because uh, you will have to present your work in front of, of our group at the end of the semester. So summarizing the key goal of this course is to learn how to overcome the data movement bottleneck by programming, benchmarking, and exploring different designs of the uh, processing in memory computing paradigm. You already know this, but I have to uh, tell you again the prerequisites of this course. We assume that you have good understanding of digital design and computer architecture. Uh, here I place a couple of links to uh, last year's uh, course of uh, Professor Mudlu's course on digital design and computer architecture spring 2021, and also uh, the website uh, for this semester where we are now, or uh, Professor Mudlu is delivering the lectures now, and we upload uh, videos and, and slides to um, the website. So these two can be a very good reference for you whenever you need to uh, go back to some of the uh, knowledge that you already have on digital design and computer architecture. Um, ideally, or you should have uh, familiarity with C and C++ programming. I don't think that that will be a problem with, uh, for anyone. And if you also have some experience with FPE implementation or GPU programming, um, that's going to be pretty useful for sure as well. And uh, what we expect from you is that you have an interest in future computer, computer architectures and computing paradigms are interested in discovering why things work or do not work, do not work and uh, solving the problems and, um, and, and, and also making systems, computing systems more efficient and more usable. Now, let me uh, introduce a little bit uh, our research group, Safari Research Group. And uh, I would like to start uh, with Professor Mudlu, who is the leader of this group. Professor Mudlu is a professor at ETH Zurich since September 2015. Uh, here you can see, um, find a link uh, to his website and also uh, his email address in case that you uh, want to uh, contact him. Um, he has many years of uh, experience in research and teaching in computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, bioinformatics, and all aspects of them. Uh, the rest of the team uh, is me who are uh, the lead supervisor um, in this course. Um, I, th I think I didn't uh, really introduce myself. Uh, my name is Juan Gomez Luna. I'm a senior researcher in the Safari Research Group since August 2017. 
And um, I work in processing in memory, of course, and also heterogeneous systems, but um, in, in many other uh, parts of computer architecture as well, and bioinformatics. I'm uh, interested in many different things. Um, the rest of the team is uh, composed by uh, Dr. Hayu Mao, also an expert in processing in memory. In particular, uh, she works with uh, uh, non-volatile memories and how to do processing in memory using these, these non-volatile memories. It's, it's likely that uh, she will, uh, one of these days, give you an introduction to uh, MVMP or processing in memory with non-volatile memories. Uh, the rest of the uh, team, uh, Geraldo, Constantinos, and Nika, they are uh, PhD students and, um, and uh, they also work on processing in memory and also uh, processing in storage and, and different uh, other aspects of uh, um, uh, computer, archi um, uh, computer architecture. So the only one in the meeting, I think, is uh, Nika. Uh, Nika, would you like to introduce yourself very quickly? Uh, say, well, what are your interests? Yeah. Yeah, sure. So yeah, as Juan mentioned, I'm a PhD student in this group and I uh, focus on uh, several research topics, um, in particular, emerging memory and computing technologies, exploring uh, efficient uh, system design for them uh, and uh, storage systems and bioinformatics. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much, Nika. Uh, you guys will learn uh, more about the uh, Nika's interests uh, next Tuesday when we, as I said before, will present uh, the project proposals that we have for this semester. Uh, if you want to learn more about us, about, about uh, other people in the research group and, uh, and about the research group in general, uh, you can um, access our website. You have the link on the slide. It's a very uh, large research group, more than 40 researchers uh, at the moment. We uh, try to disseminate our work uh, via our, um, um, of course, our research, our research, pa research papers and lectures, but also uh, our website and um, newsletters. For example, this, um, that is a, a, a a screenshot from the most recent one, the, the, the uh, newsletter that we uh, published in December 2021. And we also organize um, uh, live seminars uh, with the people from our group and also uh, other people from uh, academia and for indus from industry as well. They are uh, quite frequently, in, uh, quite frequent uh, indeed. They uh, the, essentially every month uh, we have safari life seminars we will uh, announce, announce some of them for sure over the course of the semester um, all of them are accessible uh, in youtube and 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 for sure some of them uh, will will be interesting to uh, many of you the most uh, recent one for example is um, this one which, which took place on february 28th uh, by sean lee who is one of the founders of uh, cerebras um, um, startup, a company that has fabricated uh, an amazing ML accelerator uh, with a lot of innovations, for sure, very uh, recommended talk. And um, I'm already talking about the research group, the Safari research group, and uh, I already introduced uh, what are you know, the main um, research interests of Professor Mudlu and the Safari Research Group. Here you have a little bit more detail um, that the research focus is on computer architecture, hardware, software, co-design, bioinformatics, and all as aspects of them, like memory and storage, heterogeneous and parallel systems, like for example, DPUs and FPGAs. We actually have another uh, PNS course on heterogeneous systems that you might may have also uh, seen in the course catalog that we also talk about on, on the, we also work on the uh, system and architecture intera interaction, energy efficient architectures, and, and also, as I said before, bioinformatics and architectures for bioinformatics and medicine. So now I would like you to introduce yourselves. Uh, before that, I'm going to uh, very quickly uh, stop the, um the live streaming um and uh, for you to uh, uh introduce yourself this will take just uh, a couple of minutes i i guess and uh, and we will uh, be back um in the live
Okay, I think uh, we are live now again, or if not, we will be very soon. So, um, yeah, thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Uh, course requirements and expectations. Uh, attendance is required to all meetings. Study the learning materials. Uh, each student, as I said before, will have uh, their own uh, hands-on project uh, that we will start discussing next Tuesday. Uh, we expect that you participate, asking questions, contributing uh, thoughts and ideas, and also uh, reading uh, any relevant papers uh, that we, uh, some of them will be required, some others uh, will be recommended, and uh, and we will help you all the time. You be you will be in touch with uh, me, and especially in part, uh, I mean more say intensely with the supervisor that you have, the direct supervisor that you have uh, for your project. Uh, feel free to contact us anytime, ask questions, be proactive, and um, essentially take um, advantage of this course and learn as much as possible. Um, you can probably do a very good job because we have uh, many weeks, at least I think we have like 12 weeks until the end of the semester. Um, so you have time to really do something um, interesting and something useful where you can really contribute something um, important to the state of the art in processing in memory. If your work is really good, we will help you to publish it. And, uh, and we will be for sure uh, very interested in, in publishing your work. So information about the course uh, you can find in the course website is already available. We are going to uh, upload uh, links to the, uh, to the live streams. Um, we are going to uh, upload there the slides uh, in, in, in PowerPoint and, and PDF for your reference. There are also some links to important papers and information in general about the course. There is also a Q&A forum in Moodle that you can use, but um, just do whatever is more convenient for you. You can ask questions during the lectures. You can send us uh, an email uh, after or whenever you have any question or use the uh, Moodle Q&A forum. And here uh, you, you have a um, screenshot of the uh, course and also the link to the course and the link to the uh, YouTube live stream. So for this first meeting, I already sent you an email with some learning materials. Uh, I hope you are already uh, reading and, 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 and watching them. Um, and so the required materials, let's say, they, they, they're really important ones that are going to give you like, some um, good background and some um, interesting introduction to processing in memory that is going to be very useful for your background in later lectures is this uh, book chapter, a modern primer on processing in memory and related to it, this lecture from Professor Mudlu, um, um, uh, memory-centric computing. Then there are also some uh, recommended material and another, uh, let's say, uh, introductory paper to processing in memory here, and also some uh, lectures from the computer architecture uh, the advanced computer architecture course uh, that Professor Mudlu uh, teaches. The next meeting, as you already know, is uh, next Tuesday. We will announce the projects there. You will have the chance to select your project or to rank the projects and, and, and let us know what are, what are your favorite ones. After that, we will have one-to-one -one meetings with you in order to discuss the projects, discuss your preferences, and, uh, and find what's the best fit for you. And um, yeah important that you learn uh, or study the uh, learning materials before our next meeting, because this way uh, you can also have already some background and understand better the type of projects that we will present. In next meetings, we will have the lectures on Thursday at 7 p.m., uh, but you will also have individual meetings with your supervisors or mentors. Uh, you may have one, may have two, we will see depending on uh, the project that you uh, choose. Um, um, yeah, and, and, and the actual schedule of these individual meetings is something that you guys will decide with your mentors. So in, uh, as, as you will see, we are very flexible and um, same as you can uh, contact us by email um, uh, when you need it, you can also schedule uh, the meeting at your convenience. Um, 
in the lectures, what we, we will uh, cover is uh, different aspects of processing in memory systems, of the architecture, how to program them. We will talk about these real processing in memory systems. We will talk also about interesting uh, and state of the art uh, research proposals on processing in memory. And, um, and at the end of the course, we will also have a meeting where you will present uh, your work. That probably will happen sometime in July. Uh, but if you want to, you know, start getting more and more familiar with the different contents that we will cover in the course, probably most of them were already covered in the uh, fall 2021 semester. So um, you can find them in the uh, in the website of the uh, uh, past semester. Here you see uh, links to the YouTube recordings. You have the um, uh, PowerPoint presentations. Some of these lectures will be uh, updated, let's say. We may also have some new lectures, for example, um, uh, because we uh, will likely present some of our more recent uh, works on processing in memory. And um, But yeah, in the end, uh, I, I believe that the website of the past semester is a very good reference about what are going to be the contents of in this semester. Okay, um, I am done with the say, introduction to the course, course logistics and so on. And what I'm going to do next is uh, giving you an introduction to processing in memory. We are going to start, let's say, talking about the reasons why processing in memory is needed or is going to be more and more needed um, in the near future in computing systems. And I'm going to talk about, let's say, uh, some classic proposals uh, in processing in memory, let's say classic, but recent proposals as well that are uh, or have uh, um, uh, impacted uh, uh, a lot of research in academia and industry and the development of um, these, these new processing in memory systems. Do you guys have any questions about the uh, course logistics that you want to ask now? If not, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me later if you want to clarify anything. Okay, let's just start with this uh, introduction to processing in memory. Um, the problem, as we have already mentioned before, is the data movement that is needed between the main memory and the storage and the uh, processors. So these, uh, either if it's a CPU, a GPU, or an FPE, a main memory is a critical component in all computing systems and uh, memory, the main memory must uh, scale. And this scaling is not easy and is not for free. And this is affecting uh, all types of computing systems these days. Uh, those systems with uh, CPUs, with FPEAs, with GPUs, with other types of accelerators as well. And this happens even though if you take a look at these processors, CPUs, GPUs, etc., cetera, uh, or maybe um, uh, it happens because of that, uh, the, uh, if you take a look at these systems, you will see that a large amount of their area is already spent on memory and on alleviating uh, the data movement bottleneck. bottleneck. Um, here you have um, uh, this picture here where you can identify the cores that are the red ones, but then there are a lot of uh, green and yellow blocks that are either uh, memory caches like this uh, L2 cache or L3 cache, but we also have um, shared memory controllers to access uh, an external of chip memory. So even though a lot of the space in computing systems is spent uh, in memory or is demoted to memory, we have a, a big issue with the access to the data residing in this memory and uh, this storage. Um, key, uh, so three key system trends are, the first one is that uh, the data access is a major bottleneck, as you uh, already know, because applications are increasingly data hungry. Um, energy consumption is a key limiter. I already showed you before the uh, motivation on the slide from Bill Daly. We are going to uh, see it again now, and we are also going to um, give you a little bit of more, let's say, motivational data or information about the energy consumption in current computing systems. And you will see that this uh, data movement energy dominates compute. And this is especially true for off-chip to on-chip 
uh, data movement. Whatever it comes from the storage or from the external main memory to the processor is going to be very expensive in terms of energy and in terms of execution cycles. And one of the key reasons why this happened and this problem has been worse and worse over time is because the way that the processors, device, computing devices have evolved has been much faster than the way that uh, memory has evolved. And uh, we can take a look at how memory has evolved in the, in, you know, in the, 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 say the last uh, two decades. And what we can see is that capacity has improved, of course, because we need to store more and more uh, data in memory, also in storage. So that's why it increases. Bandwidth also increases and bandwidth represents or means the amount of data that we can get from memory or from the storage uh, per um, um, unit of time, this has also increased not that much, uh, not so much as the memory capacity, but has also increased. However, the DRAM latency um, is uh, improving uh, by very, very little. And what this means is that it takes a lot of time to access. It takes uh, many nanoseconds, many execution cycles to access data that resides in memory. So memory latency in the last 20 years or more than 20 years has improved uh, or has been reduced by a very uh, little amount. And this affects many important workloads, for example, in memory databases or graph and tree processing, in memory data analytics or data center workloads. Uh, long memory latency entails a performance bottleneck. So uh, memory or the access to data affects the performance as well as it also affects the uh, energy consumption. You already know this slide. Here you can see that, for example, a 64-bit um, uh, double precision operation and addition uh, of, a, of two double numbers, uh, for example, takes uh, 20 picojoules if you compare these to the access uh, to DRAM, either a DRAM read or a DRAM write, you will see that this is almost three orders of magnitude uh, more energy to access data rather than uh, computing. And uh, and this is not something new, of course. I it's, it's of course going worse and worse uh, uh, every year, but it's something that has been observed many years ago. This is an um, an, an slide from. Uh, uh, Professor Mudlu's PhD thesis, he already observed in 2003 that most of the execution cycles for uh, the, like um, um, several important workloads that he analyzed, uh, most of these execution cycles, as I said, were spent on accessing memory. In this case, it was this was a CPU uh, with uh, uh, two levels of cache. And, uh, and as you can see here, like 55% of the total execution time was spent on uh, solving the L2 misses, which means that you missing L2 and then you have to go to the RAM to bring the data uh, to the processor. And this is in 2003, but uh, probably is uh, even worse these days. This is a more recent study from Google published in 2015, where they showed that also a huge, a large amount of uh, uh, process uh, a large amount of execution cycles was spent on accessing data. And here you see uh, some of the uh, workloads that they run in their data centers. So the problem is that data access is the major performance and energy bottleneck. And uh, one reason for that is that the current design principles cause great energy waste and also great performance loss. And the reason is that processing of data is performed, is being performed far away from the data, from, from where the data resides. And the reason for that is the way that computers have, or most of the computers have been uh, built, designed and built uh, over decades, uh, following what we call the uh, von Neumann model that considers that a computing system has three key components, one of them for computation, another one for communication, and the last one for storage and memory. So look, uh, looks like something like this, right? So in the, in the memory and storage unit, we have a memory system and a storage system. Uh, here on the leftmost side, we see this uh, uh, computing unit, for example, a CPU, a GPU, an FPGA, and in between we have this communication unit. And the problem itself is not coming from the 
von Neumann model, uh, von Neumann model. Uh, the problem is coming from uh, this communication unit and the fact that this communication unit is very narrow and provides very little bandwidth and unfortunately very long latency for the compute unit to access data residing in memory and storage units. So, uh, as I said, this affects all computing systems or, or most of them, and uh, yeah, it's due to the need to access data that resides in memory and storage. So the consequence is that uh, um, a lot of execution cycles are being spent on accessing memory and a lot of uh, energy is uh, consumed as well on doing so. And the reason is the way that current systems, current processor-centric design designs are built. They are grossly imbalanced systems where processing is done only in one place in the processor, which means that the data needs to move a lot between the memory and storage units and the processor. And this is energy inefficient, is low performance, and is also complex. And it's complex because the processors themselves are very complex because over the years, there have been, uh, so the designers have been trying to find uh, solutions to this data movement, for example, including uh, large um, and deep uh, cache hierarchies, including uh, complex prefetchers, etc. But still, there is no way of uh, 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 solving the problem forever. And the systems continue to be energy inefficient, low performance, and complex. So if you look at any system on chip, for example, what similar to the processor that you have in your computer, in your laptop, or in your cell phone, you will see that it has a CPU, GPU, multiple accelerators, it has uh, several levels of cache memory, and it, it has also a memory controller to access the external DRAM. And there is a lot of data movement uh, between all these components. And this uh, data movement dominates the energy consumption. For example, 41% of mobile system energy is spent on data movement during web browsing, or uh, like, uh, so the cost of uh, an ad operation, and this is coming from a a uh, different study is uh, more than a hundred times more, uh, consumes more than a hundred times more energy uh, uh, than uh, a simple ad operation. So uh, the, the, uh, the problem here is that we need, or the, the, the goal here is uh, to make compute systems more data centric and make them uh, processing in memory capable, which means that uh, computing is going to happen or at least part of the computing is going to, have to, to happen where the data resides or uh, where it makes sense. Uh, here you see another study that is from our group published in 2018, showing that 62.7% of the total system energy on these uh, Google consumer workloads like Google Chrome or the uh, um, uh, BP9 codec um, or I think I, I don't remember right now which ones. Oh, TensorFlow Mobile and so on. You can uh, find the details about these uh, applications in, in the paper. So for all these workloads that we are using every day uh, in our cell phones, 62.7 or in our uh, Chromebooks, 62.7% of the total system energy was spent on data movement. So we need a paradigm shift, and this paradigm shift is called processing in memory that enables computation with minimal data movement, um, computes where it makes sense or where the data reside, and makes computer architectures more data-centric or more memory-centric instead of the a classic processor-centric approach. And why memory computation today? Well, the reasons we already know, uh, it's uh, because we need to solve the data movement bottleneck. And even though this has been explored for decades, uh, only until now, um, only now it uh, starts to become a reality because technology has evolved enough to enable this change. And one example are 3D stack memories. I already talked before about one type of 3D stack memory that is uh, HVN2 that Samsung is using to build their uh, processing in memory system. Here you have a picture of a, another type of, or another um, a three stack memory from another vendor. This one is the HMC um, hybrid memory cube from Micron that um, essentially, as you see, has several layers of DRAM and at the bottom, 
of them, uh, there is a layer of uh, silicon that is uh, that can be used to embed processing elements here. This is what is called the logic layer, and uh, and it can be potentially a place to uh, to put some processing elements and compute closer to uh, where the data resides. But this is not the only innovation that has appeared in recent years and can enable processing in memory, non-volatile memories, as I mentioned before, and we will talk about them uh, as well in a future lecture. Are another of these innovations that enable processing in memory. The goal is uh, to achieve high performance and energy efficiency. And the way to do this is processing in memory, as I said. In principle, what's the idea of processing in memory? The idea is not moving everything to the memory. Of course, that's not going to happen. Why is that? Because we still need to have these powerful CPUs and GPUs uh, or FPGAs to accelerate some important parts, more, let's say, compute intensive parts of the applications, but just offload those parts of the computation, those parts of the application that make sense to offload to the memory, to the processing elements in memory. So yeah, here you can see a very you know, uh, naive <laughs> uh, figure that shows a query that is offloaded from a, this could be a query in a database and in memory database, for example, uh, the processor sends this query of loads the query to some processing unit residing near the memory and this processing unit access memory. The advantage is that it has higher bandwidth, lower latency, um, can obtain whatever data the processor needs and then sends back the results uh, to the processor core. So conceptually is very simple as you see, uh, practically is pretty challenging because there are many questions to answer and many design challenges to solve. For example, we need to design compute capable memory, different ways of doing it as we are already seeing and, and we will see in this lecture, but we may also need to modify the memory controllers or the processor chip, or we have to create new hardware and software uh, interfaces for the uh, programmers and also for the processors to communicate uh, with the processing and memory side. Um, we may need to develop new software, new languages, maybe new algorithms as well, in the end is something that uh, affects uh, the whole computing stack from the problem and the algorithm to the devices and almost the electrons as, as you see uh, in this slide. So this is uh, processing in memory. There are different types of processing in memory that we are going to cover um, in this course, actually in this lecture already. Um, here you see the first example that I mentioned a couple of slides ago. The idea of, uh, of uh, using this 3D stack DRAM and uh, taking advantage of this logic layer to put there some small processors, accelerators, for example. We will see some of these uh, examples soon. Uh, or we can also talk about processing in memory in some proposals that play some type of processing element in the memory controller itself. So instead of having to move the data all the way until the CPU core, uh, you can maybe access the data from the memory controller and compute near the memory controller. And this way you avoid, for example, polluting uh, the caches of the CPU. Or another possibility, and we have already seen one example of this, the AXDIM uh, PIM architecture from Samsung, uh, we here place the processing elements on the DIM. So these are just uh, some examples. Another example that we have already seen is the in, in, in some sense, let's say conceptually similar to the idea of using 3D stack um, DRAM and the logic layer in 3D stack DRAM, uh, we have this uh, admin pin system that in this case places the processors inside uh, the DRAM chip. And this is uh, DDR4 memory is 2D DRAM, not 3D, but we can also uh, do it there, or as I said before, um, uh, on the beam as well. And then what is the type of processor or the type of accelerator that we are going to put there on the PIM side. Well, we may have accelerators or fixed function units. We can also have reconfigurable architectures. Potentially we can have them like uh, FPGAs or we can have general purpose cores. If you take a look at the um, examples that we have in the real world already, you will see actually uh, uh, several of these. Actually there are uh, fixed function units is more or less uh, what uh, Samsung uh, is doing with their 
um, with their um, HVMP memory that only accelerates very concrete operations like Mac. Uh, so it's not really fixed function because it's programmable, but it has a very reduced instruction set, just multiplication, addition, and, and some data movement instructions. There are also reconfigurable architectures. The AX team proposal, for example, has been tested um, on a prototype that puts uh, an FPA on the DIMM. So that it's one example of reconfigurable architecture for processing in memory. And general purpose cores is what we can find, for example, in the AppMem architecture. Uh, together with this, there is one last uh, proposal, one last way of doing processing in memory. That is what we call processing using memory. And I'm going to uh, very soon describe what this is about. Um, if we, let's say, want to like classify, let's say, have the first classification of processing in memory systems, uh, you can find it in the book chapter that I uh, um, ask you to read, um, uh, say, first important reading in this uh, course. Um, and here in table one, you can already see like this uh, distinction between processing using memory and processing near memory. And this is what we are going to talk about in the rest of the lecture. We are going to talk about what they exactly mean. And we are going to see a couple of uh, interesting examples of uh, each of them. The first one being processing using memory. In processing using memory, the goal is to enable computation inside the memory using the uh, operational principles of the DRAM cells themselves or memory cells themselves and um, change the memory chip minimally. Why is that important or why is that, let's say, desirable? Because in the end, if you want to modify something that is already being fabricated, commercialized and used in um, all computing systems these days, like for example, DRAM chips, um, you want to modify them minimally, right? So if you want to put, let's say, a processor there, like a RISC-V core, for example, uh, you will need to spend much more um, area. You will need to, um, for sure, take into account uh, many different considerations that, um, in the end, will make uh, enabling this architecture uh, or, or creating this architecture a real challenge. Um, so. The idea in processing using memory is to modify the chips, the memory chips minimally and take advantage of the way that memory itself is already, um, uh, is already working. Le let's see uh, the first examples. Um, the first example that we are going to see is one way of performing data movement or data copy inside the memory without having to uh, move the data from the memory to the processor back and forth. And um, this is uh, what we call row clone, and it's a proposal that uh, takes advantage of the analog computation capability. Here you have uh, some links to some uh, relevant works in this direction. We are going to talk about them uh, now and some of them uh, more in detail in later lectures. So. Don't worry, this is just uh, an introduction to the, let's say the two main trends in processing in memory, processing using memory, processing near memory. And what I want to show you is uh, like, let's say uh, two examples that I consider classic in the sense that they are, um, um, let's say very pioneering in what they propose and have uh, produced a lot of impact um, in academia and in, uh, industry as well. So the very first one is row clone in memory copy and initialization. Why is it important? Because memory copy and initialization is used in all programs and all computers these days. Uh, so for example, from the uh, Google study that I mentioned before, they measured that 5% of the cycles were spent on data movement or in this mem move and mem copy instructions. And you may think, well, 5% is not that much. Uh, in the end, if you think about uh, one of these uh, huge data centers, 5% uh, is a lot of execution cycles and it's a lot of energy. And in the end, a lot of money that could be saved uh, if, uh, if you know, the operation themselves is done uh, in a more efficient manner. How is this operation done? These days, how is um, in today's systems, this bulk data copy, like for example, main copy that for sure you have used as uh, C programmers in the past. Um, the way that this works is that if I want to copy one page residing in memory to another page in the same memory, maybe even in the same 
uh, memory chip, I need to read the whole page uh, all the way to the CPU, place all cache lines one by one of this page in the L1, and then read the destination page, uh, cache line by cache line, perform the copy here near the processor, near the CPU in the L1, and then write back. And this operation is very high latency because in order to move uh, something that is here to another position very close to it, I have to go all the way through this memory bus, through this, through this memory hierarchy uh, up to the um, CPU. And this also entails high bandwidth utilization, this causes cache pollution because I may have in the caches data that is really useful from maybe other parts of the application or other applications. And in the end, there is a lot of unwanted data movement um, in, in this operation. And actually it's uh, very costly in terms of um, execution time. Here you have uh, some uh, measured for uh, a, a four kilobyte page copy uh, via DMA, it's like one second and, and 3.6 microjoules. If you compare these to what the uh, row clone proposal can enable, but essentially row clone does is what you have already seen, is directly copying one row, one four kilobyte page um, from one location in memory to another location in memory without having to go through the memory bus or through the uh, CPU. And this can be done with low latency, with low bandwidth or external bandwidth utilization, with no cache pollution and no unwanted data movement. And you can compare uh, the execution time and energy of the, let's say, uh, conventional way of doing in memory, of doing copy to the um, cost of in-memory copy. And you see that we are essentially improving, reducing the latency and reducing the energy consumption by two orders of magnitude. How does row clone work? It's, very simple conceptually. I'm pretty sure that you guys are familiar with how DRAM operates. As you may remember, DRAM is composed by uh, many rows, and the way of the way we read these row, rows is by uh, activating one row, in this case row A, and then uh, moving them, transferring them to their what we call the row buffer or the sense amplifiers. Uh, once the row is in the row buffer on the or the sense amplifiers, we can start reading and writing cache lines. So that's a normal operation of DRAM. So now imagine that in this situation where we have activated one row, row A, and moved it to the row buffer, now we activate another row, row B, that is the destination row. What would happen? What would happen is that we copy all the contents of the row buffer into the destination row. So this is a row clone operation, copying one entire row, to another row residing in the same DRAM subarray uh, in a very uh, little amount of time and saving a lot of energy and also with a negligible hardware cost. Another question is, if this is so simple, why is not already being done in current computing systems? Don't ask me that question. This is something that um, uh, it's actually feasible. It has even been tested in real off-the-shelf off chips by playing with the timing parameters in the access to DRAM, uh, it's not yet, uh, let's say that it doesn't exist yet officially in, uh, in real DRAM, but I'm pretty sure that it's uh, going to happen uh, very soon because the um, benefits in terms of um, uh, latency reduction and energy reduction are very clear. As you can uh, see in this slide, uh, 11 times lower latency, 74 times uh, lower energy consumption. We will talk more about this, this work, this paper in later lectures, but you can already uh, access it by yourself and start reading also, uh, you know, watching or at least uh, reading the slides as well. Um, that are available in Professor Moodle's website. And this is the other work that I mentioned, the work that is, this one is not from our group. They have shown how to execute row clone operations in real DRAM chips. The way they did it, and we will talk in detail about this compute DRAM work in a later lecture, the way they did it is by playing with the uh, timing parameters, with the latencies that you need to respect when you access um, DRAM by um, playing with them is possible, at least in 
uh, some of the different chips that they tested is possible to uh, perform row clone operations. Now the thing is, okay, row clone is nice. You can copy pages, entire pages, four kilobytes, very fast. This uh, will save a lot of execution cycles and a lot of, a lot of energy for these 5% of um, uh, cycles that are spent on the data movement, right? On bulk data movement in uh, Google data centers, but there's not really enough, right? It would be much better if we were able to do more operations, or more complex operations. For example, bitwise operations like uh, and or not majority operations and do it at low cost and do it using the analog computation capability of DRAM, which essentially is uh, using the natural way of DRAM uh, to work. Uh, the way we are going to do it is by activating multiple rows to perform the computation. And you will see very good performance and energy improvements. And this is what Ambit proposes. Uh, proposes. Let me very briefly explain you what's the key idea in Ambit is what we call the triple row activation. It's a way of doing computation with the data stored in three different rows, A, B, and C. Uh, to simplify here in the slide, you only see one cell, but imagine that you have a whole row and that's why we talk about bulk bitwise operations, because we perform the operations uh, on all the elements of, of the rows at the same time, which is um, uh, pretty good indeed in terms of uh, throughput and in the end uh, performance. So imagine that in this case, we have three different cells. As you know, a different cell um, is essentially a capacitor and an access transistor that here is represented, are represented by these switches. Um, we have three different cells. Uh, two of them are charged, and the last one is uh, uh, discharged. Um, in the normal different operation, what we do is only activating one of these rows, only closing one of these switches. Um, in this case, we activate the three rows at the same time. And what happens then is that the capacitors start leaking the charge onto the bit line. This bit line suffers a perturbation. And then depending on the sign of the perturbation or the direction of the perturbation, when we enable the sense amplifier that resides in the row buffer, uh, we will have either VDD or zero volts here in this bit line representing zero or one, the digital zero or the digital one. So the point is, uh, and after that, uh, you know, the, the, the three rows and the three cells get fully restored. Um, so, uh, but if you think about it, what is happening here is what, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a majority operation. Essentially what happened here is that we had two of the cells equal to one and one of the cells equal to zero. And after activating the three rows at the same time, the three of them ended up being uh, one being fully charged. And this is what we call a majority operation. And the, the, the way that we can represent this majority operation in terms of and and or operations is this. And uh, this can be uh, represented with this expression. So now if you observe uh, this A, B, and C, depending on what's the value of C, either if it's one or if it's zero, we will obtain an OR of A and B or an AND of A and B. For example, we can execute a bulk AND, which is a bulk bitwise AND uh, by activating three rows. So we would first uh, move data using row clone to some specific rows that are going to be those rows, um, let's say compute enabled rows that can be activated uh, at the same time after moving the rows using row clone to these um, three compute rows, we activate the three rows at the same time, and then we obtain uh, the result that in this case is the and the bitwise and um, of um, all the uh, elements. Uh, I mean, all the bits uh, in the rows. So this was first proposed in this uh, paper presented uh, or published in IEEE Cal. Uh, after that, the work uh, was improved um, in. Uh, the later paper, the Ambit paper, uh, by including uh, a way of executing the NOT operation as well. Good thing is now we have AND, OR, and NOT. And probably you guys know that if you have these three operations, you have a functionally complete set 
that allows you to create any other operation, any more complex operation like an addition, multiplication, et cetera, et cetera. The way to do not is by um, including a row or a couple of rows of uh, special DRAM cells that are called dual, dual contact cells that have not only one access transistor, but two of them. So if we want to execute not, what we do is activating one source row, um, same as we normally do. We activate this source row, then we uh, activate the uh, sense amplifier. Uh, so now the bit line is, in this case, uh, uh, charge is uh, the voltage, the BDD. And what we do next is very similar to the row clone operation, activating another row. But the row that we activate um, is one of the rows uh, of this dual contact cell that is, or this access transistor of the dual contact cell that is directly connected to the other side of the um, sense amplifier of this inverter that uh, composes the sense amplifier. So if we have one here, we'll have zero here, and this zero is copied to the um, uh, destination cell uh, when we activate this word line. So this is a way of implementing NOT. It might not be the only way of doing NOT inside DRAM, inside the DRAM subarray, but is the way that the Ambit paper proposes. And you can uh, take a look in the uh, next lecture and next slides at the um, very uh, good performance results, orders of magnitude, uh, throughput increase, uh, for these bitwise operations, also orders of magnitude uh, energy savings. Do you guys have any questions? Can when you do the all the all operation with the majority, the majority operation, isn't it like dangerous that you get like an undefined state because you're like in the middle of the logic level? Um, that could potentially happen. The fact that we are using three operands uh, and these two operands can only have two different values, zero or one, uh, makes that the bit line finally goes either to zero or one, depending on what's the, let's say, what's the majority of charge, either zero or one. Um, the uh, proposal has been uh, tested in simulation using uh, SPICE, as you can imagine, and it has shown enough reliability, not in all cases, of course, there is a small percentage uh, of cases where it fails, but that might, might still be acceptable for uh, many workloads. Uh, you may know that um, uh, machine learning workloads, for example, are uh, very robust and they accept some errors during the training, even in training, in the training process, some uh, artificial noise uh, is, is added to um, improve the robustness and the reliability of the networks. So um, even though, uh, you know, these reliability issues exist in some way, uh, but the operation is still uh, enough reliable. Okay. Makes sense. okay, yeah, thank you for the question. So I see, well, you can uh, guys think if you have uh, other questions. I see one, a couple of questions or one question here in, in the YouTube chat. Um, it says, what is meant by intra-subarray in row clone and what's different from inter-subarray in row clone? Well, essentially intra-subarray is what we explained about row clone. In row clone, we have the different subarray uh, one of the, let's say, uh, proposals in the row clone paper is called the uh, fast um, uh, operation mode where that op that is intra um, subarray consists of activating one row, then activating the sense amplifiers, and then activating the destination row. This is super fast because it happens in just very few nanoseconds, the order of um, 40 nanoseconds, and um, is activating one row and activating a destination row, and the copy is done. That's um, only possible inside the same DRAM subarray because these rows are connected to the same sense amplifier. Uh, because in the end, it's useful to have uh, more flexibility in the data movement and have the ability of moving data between subarrays or between DRAM banks. Uh, the Roclon paper proposes another uh, technique that is called uh, PSM, 
and allows this inter uh, communication. It's not as efficient, it's not as fast, but also um, usable and, uh, and, and, and potentially interesting uh, for many applications. Okay, um, yeah, I think we can continue now. I'm going to give you an example, let's say a more, uh, because uh, as of now we have seen some uh, only some uh, results for bitwise operations, but we can use these bitwise operations for more complex um, algorithms or applications. For example, uh, the bitmap, bitmap indices that these um, um, are used in, in some uh, databases and essentially consist of performing queries on some data that resides um, in memory, for example, <laughs> classifying um, uh, let's say users of a website uh, by their age. Um, for this uh, bitmap uh, index on Ambit, we observe very good performance improvements and reduction in the execution time of up to 6.6 .6 times. The reason why the performance improvement is not higher is because not uh, everything has been offloaded to Ambit. This is essentially the uh, bitwise operations that the bitmap uh, index application requires. But in the end, there is still uh, some computation that is uh, being done uh, in the CPU. Um, uh, even so, I believe that 6.6 .6 times performance improvement is, uh, is actually very good and, and very interesting. And this is the uh, uh, paper, uh, also very recommended reading. Now you might be asking yourselves, okay, you talk about one application, bitmap indices, you have also shown uh, some uh, results for micro benchmarks that are just bitwise operations. But the question is, how can we enable more complex arithmetic because more complex operations? Because as I said before, if you have and, or, and not, you have a functionally complete set, you could um, implement inside memory, for example, addition, multiplication, or uh, other operations as well. Well, this was a question we were asking ourselves for uh, a couple of years or several years. And in the end, we came up with this uh, Simdiram proposal that is an end-to-end -end framework uh, that enables you to create arbitrary operations um, inside the uh, DRAM arrays. Uh, we will cover SIMDRAM in detail in a later lecture. For now, you can uh, take a look at the paper, the presentation, the uh, videos that are available um, here in these links. And um, I'm pretty sure that is a proposal that you will uh, find very interesting as well. Okay. Uh, we are approaching to the end. I already covered the first of the trends of the first direction in processing in memory, processing using memory. You have already seen that it's a pretty simple approach or conceptually simple approach uh, where what we do is taking advantage of the way that uh, DRAM cells work and, um, and use them to perform data movement, to perform uh, some uh, bitwise operations. It's not the only, what I have explained for DRAM is not the only type of processing using memory. Non-volatile memories, for example, uh, do processing using memory in a very uh, similar manner. And, um, and as I said, uh, well, in, in some of the cases is very similar, is it's a digital manner. In some other cases, they perform analog computation. And as I said, uh, we will talk more about non-volatile memories in a future lecture as well. Now, the second direction or the second trend is uh, processing near memory. And here, the example I'm going to give you is about uh, 3D stack memories. Remember, we have multiple layers in this 3D stack designs. We have multiple layers of DRAM. And at the bottom, we have a logic layer where we can play some uh, processing elements or some uh, small cores. Um, conceptually, uh, even though I'm going to focus on uh, 3D stack memory proposals, conceptually, what uh, AppMem does with these uh, small DPUs inside the DRAM chips, even, it, even though it's not 3D memory, it's 2D memory, but conceptually is the same. So the two examples I'm going to give you also serve as a, let's say, um, uh, introduction to processing near memory and uh, classic examples of it, uh, enabled by the, in this case, the uh, hybrid memory cube that remembers, uh, remember has uh, memory layers and logic layer. And the application that we are going to um, use for motivation uh, of this um, type of processing in memory uh, is uh, graph processing. And why is that? Well, graph processing is 
very important in many uh, different applications these days. Um, a lot of uh, information from the uh, social networks, for example, is um, uh, stored in the shape of graphs, for example, to represent the connections between uh, users uh, in the in the social network. But the problem is that all these uh, graph processing algorithms and graph processing um, is uh, pretty memory bound, and we are going to see why. Uh, the fact that is very memory bound is limited in the access to memory makes that um, scaling uh, graph processing is very challenging. And here you have just some motivational uh, results for whatever graph processing algorithm, for example, PageRank 30, with 32 cores, uh, you achieve certain performance with 128 cores, that is four times more cores, uh, we can only improve the performance by 42%. Uh, and why is that? Because most of the execution time for these algorithms, and especially for these algorithms, is spent on accessing memory. So this saturates the available memory bandwidth. Remember that the communication unit in the, in the von Neumann model um, is uh, very narrow. So the amount of bandwidth that we can exploit there um, is pretty small. So that's why the workload saturate. We are going to see a more concrete example, the page rank algorithm in page rank the amount, the, the computation is uh, pretty simple. As you see, uh, we have to visit uh, all vertices of the node and then one by one uh, visiting the successors of this node in order to um, update the rank of each of the vertices. This is very simple computation, as you see, just one multiplication and one addition. But the problem with this is if your graph is huge and that's pretty likely these days, um, the data will occupy a lot of memory, right? So you cannot have the entire graph in the, in the cache. You cannot have the entire graph uh, near the processor. So what that uh, means is that you have very frequent memory accesses and these accesses are going to be random. Why is that? Or, or let's say almost random. Why is that? Because uh, graphs are uh, by definition very irregular. I may have uh, two friends in Facebook, you may have 500 friends, maybe some of our friends are common, other friends will be completely different. Um, and all this variability uh, makes the computation very regular and the memory access is very regular. So what happens is that when you bring one whole cache line to the processor, likely you won't use most of the data in this cache line. So then you need to go again to memory and bring another cache line. So this is uh, one key problem here. The other key problem is that I bring the data to the processor, but I don't compute enough to amortize the cost of bringing the data because there is very little amount of computation, just one multiplication and one addition, right? So how do we solve this problem using processing in memory? We are going to see two classic approaches here. The first one is a coarse grain accelerator, similar to, in some sense, to a GPU where you can offload a whole kernel and or almost a whole application and run it there and make it much faster. So um, here in one of the proposals that I'm going to present, uh, what we did was designing an accelerator, a coarse grain accelerator for graph processing workloads. And the other proposal is uh, a completely uh, different approach. In this case, it's minimal processing in memory or processing near memory support. Instead of having a coarse grain accelerator, what we have is a small execution units near the memory and we offload the specific operations to them. And as you will see, the approach is very similar to what DRAM vendors are uh, already doing, like uh, this uh, Samsung um, uh, HPM pin um, that um, uh, we have already mentioned. And now you will see this uh, proposal that is called uh, PIM enabled instructions. And then in one later lecture, we will talk in more detail about the Samsung architecture. But let's uh, start with the other option, right? Let's uh, start with this course bringing an accelerator that is called uh, Tesseract. Observe uh, how it looks is uh, here, what you see on the uh, leftmost side, it's a four by four. So in total, uh, 16 of these uh, cubes of these uh, HVM stacks inside um, each of the uh, cubes, we have the memory layers and we have also the logic layer. What do we have inside the logic layer? We have a bunch of these um, blue squares that are 
are small processors, very, very um, small processors in order cores that have access uh, to the memory layers uh, through a, a memory controller and also have access to a network interface uh, for communication with other uh, cores inside the same stack using this crossover network or to other cores in other cubes, as you see um, here on this part uh, of the figure. Uh, the Tesseract system was compared to different configurations of uh, conventional processor-centric systems like um, uh, out-of-order cores, in-order cores with uh, DDR3, DRAM, with uh, HMC uh, memory, and uh, the uh, performance improvement was uh, really good for um, several uh, graph processing algorithms, in total five graph processing algorithms that were used as benchmarks for this study. In the best case, it's almost uh, 14 times faster than uh, the, let's say, uh, simplest uh, baseline that is an out of order processor with DDR3 memory, which is um, very similar to uh, the type of uh, CPU or the type of processor that we uh, use on our uh, daily basis. Also, in terms of uh, energy reduction, you see eight times energy reduction uh, of Tesseract over the uh, out-of-order core, the CPU, even using HNC memory that provides higher bandwidth uh, by default than uh, DDR3 memory, but it's still uh, eight times uh, energy reduction. You can find more details in the slides and in the paper uh, of, uh, of this uh, uh, ISCA 2015 paper. And now the other proposal is uh, because, okay, you uh, can think um, this um, accelerator looks pretty good, right? But you're using there uh, 16 of these uh, HV HMC stacks and they don't look like a very cheap thing, right? They probably are way more expensive than the conventional 2D DRAM. Um, yeah, that's true. So probably building one of these accelerators is not going to be cheap. It's going to be very energy efficient, very high performance, but it might not be the best solution for all computing systems, right? My, uh, computing systems are, um, uh, or we uh, desire computing systems be um, uh, cheaper, like laps laptops that we use, uh, cell phones, etc. So. What about uh, providing processing in memory capabilities, but with minimal support, with minimal modifications? And that's uh, this team enable instructions uh, paper that was presented uh, actually at the same time as the uh, Tesseract proposal. For the motivation, again, uh, we go back to the uh, page rank algorithm. Um, remember, computation is very simple, just multiplication, just uh, addition. The problem here is that we have very random memory accesses when uh, reading the successors of a specific node or vertex of the graph. Uh, so uh, what this means is that we need to bring all the time cache lines from the memory, uh, the main memory to the host processor. And then when we don't need this cache line anymore, we have to write back the whole cache line uh, to the memory. And this essentially means 64 bytes in, 64 bytes out. This is a lot of data movement that probably is not amortized by the computation done by these uh, graph processing workloads. So what this uh, PIM enable instructions paper or PEI paper proposes is replacing some of these operations with operations that will be executed in the memory, in some specialized unit in the memory. For example, an addition. Uh, we can replace the conventional addition that is done executed on the host processor by this PIM add that will be executed in the main memory. And in this case, instead of having to read 64 bytes, operate and then write back 64 bytes, what we can do is just sending the value, the number that we have to add uh, to the main memory and perform the addition there. Good thing is that instead of reading and writing 64 bytes, we just write or send to memory eight bytes and we are done. And the PEI paper shows very nice results for different graph processing algorithms, but also other benchmarks uh, from data analytics, from machine learning and data mining, um, etc. And uh, and here you see some uh, supported uh, PIM operations. This is just, um, um, I mean, that uh, let's say uh, operations that we're using the PEI paper to showcase what are the 
possibilities on what's the potential of this uh, type of proposal, but are things that make uh, a lot of sense for uh, all these applications here, like, for example, integer increment, uh, calculation of minimum, addition, hash table probing, or um, um, histogram computation, Euclidean distance, dot product, etc. Very simple operations that are offloaded to the uh, memory side and can be uh, executed there faster and in a more energy efficient manner. Sometimes may happen that your data already resides in the cache, right? In the cache of the CPU because it has been used before for some reason. Well, to deal with that situation, what we can have is something like a, a locality monitor that essentially is a unit that checks where the data resides before executing an operation. Uh, this locality monitor essentially will check if some particular value is already in the caches. If it's in the caches, then you don't need to upload to the main memory. But if it's not in the caches, then you upload the uh, specific ex um, instruction to the main memory. Um, um, and then I can show you in this slide an example PI uh, microarchitecture. This would be like, let's say, the baseline microarchitecture, the baseline processor uh, with the out of order core. And here we have the three levels of cache, the memory controller, and the uh, uh, you know external off chip memory. In this case, a three stack memory similar to uh, HMC. The PEI architecture proposes to extend this baseline architecture with these PCUs that are the execution units near the memory or um, actually inside the um, uh, memory stack in the logic layer. Uh, and also this uh, PEI management unit that is the locality monitor responsible for checking if some the value that I need to compute on uh, is in the last level cache or other levels of the cache or um, instead if it's uh, in memory and doesn't reside in the cache. So depending on that, I will execute the operation here or I will execute the operation there, right? The proposal uh, results in uh, uh, very, uh, say, nice performance results, not so, say, uh, large as uh, the speed ups and uh, energy savings that we have seen for Tesseract because that's a coarse grain accelerator. Uh, but uh, but it's still uh, it's uh, pretty uh, interesting. So here, for example, for large uh, data sets, uh, we we obtain almost fifty percent performance improvement uh, as a geomin for all these different workloads, and also uh, energy savings uh, quite um, uh, significant as well. For large uh, data sets, it's about 25 less energy consumption in this case. Of course, it doesn't make sense to use the processing in memory capabilities if your data set is very small, because if it's very small, very small, very likely will fit in the uh, cache hierarchy of the CPU or the GPU. So you don't need to go to memory so frequently. And that's why, as well, it's important to have this locality aware execution that can lower this. Um, large execution time of the ping only uh, case for small data sets uh, can you know, reduce, not the execution time, this is energy consumption, can reduce it significantly. And uh, if the locality aware monitor is, uh, um, let's say, fine, is, is well tuned and works properly, uh, then you can get the best of uh, both worlds, right? Whenever the CPU can compute, you compute on the CPU. Whenever data doesn't reside on the memory hierarchy, on the cache hierarchy, you go to the uh, main memory and execute the operation there. So this is the paper for your reference. And, um, and this is almost all for today. We have already covered uh, the uh, two directions, processing using memory and processing near memory. Let me know, guys, if you have uh, any questions um, from this uh, last part. Um, I have, I'm reading a, a question I have in the, here in the YouTube chat, it says, um, uh, it says, is not processing near memory just another iteration of GPU? GPUs have the same concept, shared memory, which is closer to thread blocks, don't they? Well, this is uh, actually a very uh, good question, and, and I like that uh, people are already thinking about the comparison of processing in memory systems to uh, GPUs. Um, it's true that there are some things in common. The fact that in a processing in memory system and the way that we are already describing them, uh, what we do is 
uh, identifying what computation is good for the processing in memory part, for the processing in memory system, and offload that computation uh, to the processing in memory side. And that's uh, also what we do in, in GPUs. So GPUs um, are external accelerators. Whenever we have something that is, uh, for example, highly data parallel and can benefit from the architecture of the DPU, we offload the computation to the DPU. In that sense, uh, they, are dif they are similar. What is different? Um, it's uh, different the fact that the um, CPU accelerator, the, the, the GPU accelerator is a completely different accelerator, completely decoupled from the host processor, discrete GPUs that are the most powerful ones are typically connected through a PCI Express bus. So what this means is that we have to move all the data from the main memory of the CPU to the global memory of the GPU. And then when you execute on the GPU, there you have a lot of parallelism, you have a very powerful device, but this powerful device also has to access an external memory, its own DRAM or global memory uh, that uh, in the end suffers from the same problem, the data movement bottleneck. Uh, in a processing in memory system, even if it's an external accelerator like the Tesseract proposal, and you have to move data from main memory to the memory of the external accelerator, it doesn't suffer from uh, data movement um, when the computation starts um, on the memory side. Why is that? Because processing in memory systems enjoy much higher bandwidth, much lower uh, latency, and um, at least for those uh, applications and those algorithms that are uh, clearly memory bound, um, they solve the problem in some way. That's the, uh, essentially the key idea of processing in memory. Okay, I hope this solves the question. I don't know guys if you um, have any question related to that one to the comparison to GPUs. We will see comparisons to GPU from for some of these systems and for um, um, you know, the results that we have obtained ourselves and, and um, a good analysis of what's, uh, let's say, suitable for a GPU or suitable for a processing in memory system. There is a lot to do as well uh, in this direction. Okay, another question I see here, is it practical to have PIM core in cache? What is the um, area uh, tall compared to DRAM implementation? Well, that depends, yes. So the first answer is yes, it's possible to have processing elements in the cache and there are uh, actually several research proposals doing that. Um, there are research proposals that um, even uh, uh, place uh, processing elements near the cache, but then also processing elements in the memory controller or um, in the DRAM chips. Um, and um, depending on the characteristics of the application, they can be uh, pretty uh, beneficial and pretty uh, good ideas. Uh, also, uh, even in, so also in caches, there are uh, processing using memory proposals. There are, um, uh, several interesting proposals and even uh, some chips are being fabricated that take advantage of the uh, analog operation of SRAM in a similar way of what I explained uh, for row clone and Ambit in DRAM. Something similar is also possible that I mentioned non-volatile memories, uh, but uh, that something like that is also possible in, in SRAM and there are a um, few interesting proposals uh, about it. So it's, uh, um, also, we can also talk about uh, processing near SRAM, processing using SRAM, and, and all these uh, processing near cache or using the cache uh, proposals are also um, uh, included in the uh, larger umbrella of processing using memory or pr processing in memory. Um, so, yeah, I think um, I hope that answers the question. It's um, something that we will definitely discuss uh, as well in later lectures. Okay, the last thing I have for you guys to finish the lecture, and thank you very much for uh, your attendance and for your interest. Um, there are uh, uh, still barriers that we need to uh, eliminate in order to, uh, you know, make a, an ample, um, let's say, um, adoption of processing in memory, right? So there are things to, uh, to solve, and that's why we keep doing research on that, and that's why in processing in memory, and that's why uh, we uh, offer these courses uh, to uh, teach about processing in memory and to 
um, let's say, enable more people to be, you know, qualified to solve the, these barriers for the adoption of PIM. And here you have a, a list of these um, issues, uh, defining the functionality for processing in memory systems, writing code for processing in memory systems, finding ways of making the lives programmer, uh, programmers' lives uh, easier because in the end, if you have a new system, you have to learn how to program it and, and hopefully the learning curve don't, won't be um, that, uh, that high. Um, we need to, you know, solve other system related considerations like how to maintain uh, coherence, how to deal with uh, virtual memory in the processing in memory system and, uh, and many other things. Uh, we will talk about uh, all these barriers uh, over the course of the semester. Uh, we will also have like a dedicated uh, session to, you know, clarify uh, all these uh, uh, different barriers and the, the different things that we are trying to do to solve uh, these barriers and, and enable uh, definitely uh, the adoption of processing in memory. But all these uh, barriers can be solved with a change of mindset that requires to revisit the entire computing stack and, um, and, and, and get there uh, step by step by uh, changing the devices, by changing the interfaces for programmers, for the um, software to uh, operate on the hardware and also changing the way we think about the algorithms and we program them. Um, many of the, uh, the different things that I have covered in this lecture and we will continue covering in later lectures and in this uh, book chapter, A Modern Primer on, in proce uh, on Processing in Memory. Uh, here you have the abstract and, uh, and here you have the uh, table of contents of the uh, paper that, as you know, guys, is a uh, required reading uh, for you for this uh, week. This is all for today. Let me know if you have any questions. I hope you uh, enjoyed the lecture and find the topic interesting. And um, yeah, I'm uh, all ears if you want to ask. There are also a couple more questions here in YouTube. says it feels that the only difference is the actual copying to global GPU memory. If CPU and GPU cores have the same level of access to memory, it still feels to be the same. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe that's the only difference. The thing is that um, that difference is, uh, um, is, um, is pretty big and uh, entails that processor-centric systems like current CPUs and GPUs suffer from the data movement bottleneck and spend large amounts of execution cycles and uh, energy in uh, accessing data. Uh, what processing in memory does, this is not uh, proposing, let's say, a new device. This is not proposing a new accelerator. It's a different computing paradigm that can be useful for different types of devices, we can extend Z CPUs with processing in memory capabilities, same as we can extend GPUs or other accelerators with processing in memory capabilities. Um, in a couple of weeks uh, or two, three weeks, we will be talking about the uh, Samsung HVM PIM that has uh, already been prototyped and tested against GPUs uh, and um, um, in, and, and it's uh, designed to operate in cooperation with a central GPU. So in the end, it's not processing in memory or uh, conven um, conventional CPUs or GPUs. It's more like improving existing computing systems by enabling processing in memory. Yes, another question is uh, with PCI Express 6 now, it feels GPUs uh, main copy latency would reduce drastically too. Yeah, that's true. Uh, every time we have a new um, external bus, um, it's faster. That's true. The problem is if you compare how fast these uh, external buses evolve and how fast their throughput, their bandwidth increases over time, that's much uh, a slower pace than, than what happens with the logic, what happens with the CPU cores and with the GPU cores. Even if you go, for example, to NVIDIA GPUs and you compare 
um, G80 GPU from 2006 or, two, or 2007 and check what's uh, the, its uh, peak uh, compute throughput and what its peak bandwidth, you will see that the ratio between them is smaller than the ratio of compute throughput and memory bandwidth in an A100 released in uh, 2020. What this means is that the problem is not being solved by the fact that uh, now memory has higher bandwidth or the PCI Express uh, also provides a uh, higher bandwidth. The problem is that even though these improve, the cores themselves improve at a much faster pace. So that's why uh, processing in memory can help for many, many workloads. Okay, you guys uh, in Zoom, let me know if you have uh, any other question. If not, I think it's enough for today, uh, like uh, one hour, 45 minutes almost. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your questions. Thank you very much uh, for your um, interest. Uh, if you don't have uh, any uh, other question, I think we are done for today and I I uh, hope to see you uh, next Tuesday and discuss the projects with you. Uh, let's see if I can uh, see what's going on here. Yeah. Let me stop the live stream.